Hi everyone, welcome to our lecture on multidimensional arrays. Uh, let me share my screen. So basically we covered the race and all of the methods related to arrays. We, we talked about uh, sorting, searching, binary search. And today we will continue with multidimensional arrays. Before the class starts, uh, a few changes uh, in course documents where we post the labs. Now the labs are in reverse order. So you don't need to scroll anymore to the bottom of the page. The labs for the next lab are basically going to be posted right here on the page on the top of uh, course documents. Again, if you want to uh, see the recordings, all the lectures are recorded and available on uh, Piazza with links with this playlist on YouTube that contains all of the lectures. Also, you will see here interleave the labs. So all the labs are going to be recorded and we are going to post them for the rest of the semester. So let's start with our lecture for the day. So today we'll discuss about multidimensional arrays. Just to remind everyone, we talked about arrays before uh, and basically problems related to arrays. Just to remind everyone a few examples of arrays. So we know how to define an array. For instance, we define an integer array, let's say A, and it's a new integer array and you specify how many elements are in that array. And then if you want to access the elements of the array, you would use an index. So A of zero is assigned seven. That's basically uh, the basics of arrays. We declare arrays in Java and we use the same definition that you used before. We define the type of the variable and then the variable itself. We, we initialize an array and only now, now you can see that A is actually a reference is basically the address of an array of integers that is stored in the heap, the dynamic segment of memory. And then we access the elements of the, the array using indexed variables. They are basically variables like arrays with an index. So again, just to see how this is stored in memory is very important for the lecture today. I'm going to use paint to draw what basically is happening in these two lines of code. So first of all, we have the declaration of the array, which creates a location in memory that will store an address. Initially, before we assign anything to that address, the address is null. But once we create a new integer array, which this integer array is actually created on the heap. So somewhere on the heap, we'll basically have an integer array. And I can represent it vertically, but usually it's like a sequential block of memory. In this case, new integer array of 10 integers will basically create 10 integers that are all initialized to zero initially. So basically we have something like this, zero, 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 and zero, 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 zero. And each one of these elements has an index. So in the indexes start with zero, for the first element, and then we have the rest of the elements of the array. You can get the length of the array. Uh, the variable itself is a reference, and that's quite important. So basically, it's the address of this location in memory that actually contains the elements of the array. And as I said, we can access every element of the array using the index. And in this case, the index variable a of 0 is equal with 7 will modify the value of the first element to seven. Uh, not, not here, sorry about that, here. So basically we have, this is an array and this is how we access the elements of the array. Today we'll discuss about multidimensional arrays. So let's start with an opening problem. Let's say that I want to store all of the distances between uh, large cities in US. So we'll, we'll have the distance from Chicago to Boston, from Chicago to New York, uh, to Atlanta, Miami, Dallas, Houston. Then we have the distances from Boston to Chicago, to New York, to Atlanta, Miami, Dallas, Houston, and so on. 
So basically for each city, we actually have one array that stores the distances for that uh, corresponding city. So for this, you need a matrix. You need basically a bunch of rows and in each row you have multiple elements, which one corresponding to one of the columns in the matrix. So what we want is to have a type that represents matrices. And if you think about it, it's actually just an array. So we have an array that represents the distances for Chicago, another array that represents the distances from Boston. So the entire matrix is an array of arrays, each one of them basically being the distances for one of the cities. So a multidimensional or a two-dimensional array is basically an array of an array of some given data type. So we basically used exactly the same notation that we used when we defined normal arrays, unidimensional arrays. So the reference variable is an array, and we have this open close bracket, the one to the right, which represents basically the fact that this is an array, but the elements of that array are not of a primitive data type or uh, an object type, but they are actually arrays themselves. So this is a two-dimensional array in which we have an array of arrays of some data type. Uh, that's the data type of the elements. This declares the variable, which basically will store this reference that will store the address of the multidimensional array. Now, if you want to create an array and assign this reference to that variable, once you create a variable, either in the same statement or in a different statement, you can assign it with a new. And now we specify two dimensions. So it's a new data type for the type of the element. And then we have the number of rows and the number of columns. How many rows we have? In our case, basically that's the number of, the first number represents the number of rows. And the second number represents how many elements are each in each row. You can combine the declaration and creation into one single statement. So the reference variable is a matrix of some data type, which is the reference to a new array of that data type of 10 rows and 10 columns each. An alternative syntax, again, is not preferred because it mixes the variable with the type definition, is the one that is inherited from C, in which you have the data type of the element, then the reference variable, and then the fact that this is an array of arrays. Okay. It's not preferred, but is for historical reasons accepted. So let's see an example. We want to declare a matrix of 10 rows by 10 columns. So first we declare the variable matrix, either by using this def definition in which we specify that this is an array of arrays of integers, or uh, same but mixed with the type. Again, this is the second notation is not preferred, but you should be uh, aware of its existence. So, and then once the variable is declared, you can initialize it with the reference of a new integer array of 10 rows and 10 columns. The first argument is actually the number of rows. And the reason for that is that it's more natural for a programmer to write the number of rows preceding the number of columns in every row. Okay. So this is the way to actually define a matrix or a multidimensional array. Now, one thing to remember again is the fact that in fact, a matrix is just an array of arrays. Okay. So if again, we go and see how is this represented in memory. So this was for unidimensional arrays. Basically we had uh, a reference to an array of integers. For a matrix, we have something similar. Let me actually delete it. We can always redraw it. So we have, let's say, an integer matrix M, which is a new integer array of three rows and four columns each. So what exactly, how is this in memory, represented in memory? So again, M is a reference. What is it a reference to? 
it is a reference to an array that contains references to every single row. So you can see it the following way. You have an array, I will represent it vertically because it's basically kind of like the rows. And in each one of these rows, you basically have a reference. So you have the first reference, the second reference, and the third reference. Now, each one of these references is an address of the row, corresponding row. So here we have a row that corresponds to row number zero or the first row, a row that corresponds to the second row, and uh, another array that corresponds to the third row. So we have three references. This is the address of this array. And this is the address of this array. Okay. So now this is an array of three rows of three columns each. So basically, by default, each one of these will be 0, 0, 0, 0, and the same for the other arrays. So this is 0, 0, 0, 0, and this is 0, 0, 0, 0. And now you have indices for the rows. So for instance, zero is the, uh, the first row, one is the second row, two is the third, ro uh, third row. And then you have indices for the elements in each one of these rows. So you have zero, one, two, three for the three elements. And similarly for the other ones. So you have zero, one, two, three, okay? So now you can use indices to access any one of these elements. So for instance, if you write M of one, two is assigned seven. So now the first argument is the number of the row. So is M of one and two is equal with seven. So the value of this element here is modified to seven. So that's basically, uh, it's again, the representation is just an array of arrays. So each one of the elements, you can access the first row using the index. So that will give you basically, uh, again, it's for simplicity reasons. The first argument is actually the row number and the second argument is the column number. So M of one would give you the first row, the second row, the row with index one. And then M of one, two would give you basically this element. This is M of one, two for index two for the column index, okay? And you can use these index variables. Now you have two indices. It will allow you to access any row and any column in that row. So let's continue. Again, feel free any moment to ask me if you have any questions. So we can use indices for accessing the elements. So a matrix of zero, zero will be assigned three is basically the matrix as at the first row index zero and the first column index zero is assigned three. You can actually use the length so matrix.length will give you the number of rows in our matrix and matrix of i.length will give you the number of row uh, columns elements in the row number i. So for instance, if I want to write a little algorithm that uh, in initializes every element in the matrix with a random number between zero and 999, I will iterate with a loop over the rows for every i from index zero, as long as i is less than matrix dot length, which is the number of rows. I increment i with one at after each iteration. I have a nested loop for every j starting with zero, as long as j is less than the length of the current row matrix of i for the previous i that was out in the outer loop. So, I iterate over the elements from index zero to the length of that matrix. 
of that uh, column or of that row, sorry. Matrix of row I and column J is assigned a map.random multiply with a, a thousand. So really, if we return back to our application, there are two lengths. One is the number of rows, which you can get with M dot length. So basically M is the first uh, dimension, basically the matrix itself, M dot length gives you the number of rows that you have in that matrix. And then for every one row, you have the number of elements that you have in that row. So for instance, M of zero dot length is the length of row zero. And for row number one, we have M of one dot length is the length of the second row, uh, M of two dot length is basically the length of the third row. If one would want to get M of three dot length, that doesn't exist, is index out of bounds. So really the problem is that the number of elements, the number of rows that I have in this uh, uh, matrix is three. So the indices are from zero to two included. M of three doesn't exist. It's basically the, the next row that is not in the, in the, in the matrix, okay? Any questions up to now? And then we'll do algorithms with uh, matrices. Okay. So here are a few examples. So first I define matrix as a new integer matrix of five rows by five columns. Matrix.length gives me the number of rows. In this case, I have five rows. Matrix of zero dot length gives me the number of elements in row zero. In this case, is also five because there are five elements in row zero. If I initialized matrix of two and one is assigned seven, is basically the row with index two, which is the third row. And in that row, the column with index one, which is basically this element is assigned seven. Here is another example. You can use a shorthand notation for initializing and uh, uh, for creating, declaring, and initializing an array in one single statement. So if you remember, we had something similar for sim single dimensional arrays. You can create an array and initialize it in one single statement. You can basically define an integer array A and assign the, the elements in A, like one, two, one, two, three, four, and so on. So really that was a syntactic sugar. It, it's basically equivalent with a statement that says integer array A is assigned a new integer array of four elements. And then we use indices to assign values to every one of those elements is A of zero is assigned one. And then A of one, two, and three are assigned the corresponding values. So in this case, those values are two, three, and four. Similar to that, we have four matrices. So for matrices, we can define an integer matrix M. And this is basically a row, a, a, a number of rows and each row basically is defined separately. So we have one, two, three in the first row. Maybe we have four, five, six in the second row. And that is it. Basically this is a two, a two dimensional matrix that has two rows and three elements in each row. So again, this is equivalent. It's just a syntactic sugar that internally gets compiled into integer matrix M is a new integer array of two rows and three columns each. And then M of zero 
zero is assigned one and then m of zero one is assigned two and m of zero uh, two is assigned uh, uh, three and then we have three more elements assigned so m of one zero is assigned four five and six so basically it's just a syntactic sugar this is transformed into this internally we declare the array we create the array and then we initialize every one of those elements of the array so in this example in this example that we have here this array array uh, the length of the array again array dot length will give us the number of rows in this case is four and array of zero dot length uh, gives us the number of elements in row zero which is three and similarly, if you want array of one dot length is three, array of two dot length is three, and array of uh, three dot length is three. Okay. So basically, this is how it's stored in memory. We define an integer array x. X is actually a reference to an array of references. In this case, is three rows and four columns in each row. So we have x of zero, x of one, and x of two. Each of, them, each of them is a reference to basically an array of four elements each. So we have x of zero, zero, x of zero, one, x of zero, two, and x of zero, three in the first row. We have basically x of zero gives us the row zero, and then we can get the elements in columns zero, one, two, and three. And again, x dot length is the number of rows, in this case is three, and x of zero dot length gives us the number of elements in the first row, basically in a row in the row x of zero, in which case is four. And similarly, because this was a matrix, a rectangular matrix of three rows and four columns each, x of one and x of two dot length gives us four. Okay, any questions? I see a question in the chat. Do the rows need to be written in different lines or we just put them comma between and they can be in the same line? They can be in the same line. So in Java, uh, spaces are completely ignored by the compiler. So you can definitely put them like this. I personally like to put them in different lines because then I don't need to read a long uh, sausage. <laughs> I can basically read that this is a matrix and I can see it easily. Okay. You need to put these curly braces here because otherwise, if you don't have this here, then the meaning of this, this is a matrix that has a single row that has the numbers from one to six. So that's a completely different matrix than the one that is this one in which I have two rows. And basically those are the elements of, there are three elements in each row. Okay, good. Okay, so this is the shortcut notation. You can declare and initialize and create the two-dimensional array in a single statement. So you define the variable array as a matrix, an integer matrix. And then basically the fact that this is an array of four rows and each, each row you have three elements. The first row has one, two, three. The second row has four, five, six. Third row has seven, eight, nine, and last row has 10, 11, 12. But this is really same as with declaring, initializing the matrix, and then assigning values to every corresponding value. Okay. Now, I've seen different variations of this. So you can actually also use the index to access the entire row. So instead of, you can do something like this. So let me. So you can define the matrix that M is a matrix of two rows of three integers each. And then you can assign like this, M of zero is equal with a new integer array. And then you have the values one, two, three. Okay, that's another way to define it. So in this case, I have two rows of the elements, 
one, two, three, and four, five, six. So that's very seldom that I see something like this. Usually it's either that everything is defined in the same line or they are defined separately. So basically every element is assigned and an array is created and so on. But that was also possible. Okay. Any questions? Now, the first question that may come to your mind is, so I see that I have a matrix, but I not, there is no requirement that I have the same number of elements in every row. I could have in one row, three elements, in one row, two elements and so on. So such a matrix is actually called a ragged array or a ragged matrix is a matrix in which the number of the rows have different lengths. At least two rows have different lengths. Okay. So in this example, I define a matrix, which is an array of arrays of integers. And the first row I have one, two, five, one, two, three, four, five. In the second row, I have two, three, four, five, and so on. It's not a requirement that you have some kind of a triangular matrix. As long as one row has a different number of elements than another row, you have what is called a ragged array. Basically an array where the number of rows can have different lengths, okay? So most matrices, are rectangular matrices. You have certain number of rows and each row has the same number of elements. Like in this case, I have array is a matrix of integers. I have four rows in row number one, two, three, and four, basically in, with indices zero, one, two, and three, I have the same length. I can compare the lengths and I have the same length. If I would want the length of array of index four, that doesn't exist because array of four is out of the bounds of the matrix. There is no row with index four. So ragged arrays, as I said, are those arrays in which at least one, uh, one row has a different number of elements. And it's actually quite easy to write a method to check if an array, a matrix is ragged. So let me show you how to do that in Eclipse. So now we, we can start writing programs in Eclipse using matrices. So I'm defining a new matrix M, which let's actually define a ragged array. So I'm going to have in the first row one, two, three. In the second row, maybe I have four, five, six. In the third row, I have seven, eight, nine, actually seven and eight. Let's let this be a ragged one. And then I have in the last row, nine, 10, 11. So even this is what is called a ragged array because basically the number of uh, elements in at least one row is different than another row. So, Let's actually see how to see if this matrix is ragged. So first we'll need the function. So let's define a function public static boolean is ragged and it takes as an argument, an integer matrix. Let's call it A. So it's different than the one in the main method. And it's not a required, you could use M as well. And first of all, what I would do is to save in a variable, the length of the row zero. So L of zero is A of zero dot length. Then in a for loop for every integer index, let's say I from zero, as long as I is less than the number of rows in that, Let's start from one, in fact, in that matrix. If the number, if L0, the number of elements in row zero is different than the number of elements in A of i dot length, then return true because that matrix is ragged. 
Otherwise, if I went over all the rows and they all have the same length with length with row zero, then return false. So this is a function that basically returns if this matrix is ragged or not. Okay, so let's test it. So I'm going to write test it with uh, printing if this matrix that I had before is ragged. And let's invoke is ragged of M. So if I run this program, it will say true because that matrix is ragged. Uh, in fact, I do have in one of the rows, two elements, which is less than the number of elements in the row number zero. Let's test it on a matrix that is not ragged. So let's define a matrix M2 and M2 contains the elements one, two, three in the first row, four, five, six in the second row, seven, eight, nine in the third row, nine, 10, 11 in the fourth row. And now we can ask is M2 ragged? So M1 still prints true, but M2 prints false because it's not a ragged matrix. So this function actually does what we wanted. We want it basically to see if the matrix is ragged. Another common function that you may actually want to implement is a print matrix. So for instance, let's actually implement it as a function, print matrix of M. And similarly for the second one, we'll also print it. So let's put it here, print matrix of M2. Okay. So similar to the previous function, I'm going to basically define a function. So public static void, because it's printing only print matrix takes an integer matrix A. And here we have a for loop that iterates over the rows. So for an integer I starting with zero, as long as I is less than a dot length is the number of rows and I is incremented after each iteration. Then we have a for loop to iterate over the columns in the current row. So integer J is starts with zero as long as J is less than the number of elements in the current row A of I. So even if it's ragged, it will print it fine. And then J is incremented with one at every step. And then we print the element at that row and column. So print A of I, J, followed by a space. And in each, after we finish every row, we basically print a new line. So system dot out. In fact, let me also print a new line after the matrix. So it looks nice. So I iterate over every row. For every row, I print the entire row with a nested for loop with a variable j that ranges from zero to the length of that row. I print every element followed by a space. Then at the end of each row, I print a new line. And at the end of each matrix, I print a new line. So let's run it. It will print the two matrices M and M2. So we run it, we see the first matrix is basically this one. The second matrix is this one. First one was ragged and it didn't encounter any problems in printing it. So there are a few questions. Can we make a ragged array with only the number of rows and columns like int of matrix? No, so, okay, you can. So you can create an array and then recreate one row. So you can do something like this. You can do, this is a new integer array of two rows of three columns each. And then uh, M of zero is assigned a new integer array of four elements. So let's see what it, it happens now. Basically what happens now is the first row is four zeros 
And the second row is the original three zeros. And that's exactly what we got. So this always, this definition always creates a rectangular matrix because you have two indices, you have the number of rows and the number of columns in each row. But then you can take separately the any row, like row zero, row one, and create an array for that rows. It's like basically redirecting uh, our reference to this new location. So it's really, you are saying, what we are saying is, M of, uh, let's say M of zero is assigned a new array of two elements. You are basically deleting the old reference and you are creating a new reference to basically a new array that will be uh, containing the new elements. Basically these are, let's say only two elements, okay? And the old array will be garbage collected. So the program, the Java compiler interpreter will actually realize that this is not referred anymore from anywhere and it's gone, okay? So that's exactly what we did here in these two lines. Kevin, does that respond to your question? I, yes, good, welcome. Okay, good, so let's continue. So how uh, any matrix is stored, including a ranked matrix, like for instance, this triangle array is a reference to an array of references for every row from zero to four, with five rows. And each row is a reference to a different array that corresponds to the elements in that row with every element at every column. So that's why we basically get uh, a double referencing. We have a reference from the variable to the references to every single row separately. Now, how can we actually initialize a two-dimensional array? So basically, let's say that we have a scanner that was created for the input system uh, input stream. We ask the user enter the matrix length number of rows and matrix of zero dot length number of columns. So this basically informs the user, you should enter a rectangular matrix of 10 rows and 10 columns each. Then you have a for loop one that the outer loop iterates with a row variable for the index between indexes zero to the length of that matrix and incrementing with one every row after each iteration. And then a nested, an inner loop that iterates from column zero, as long as the column is less than matrix of row of that row dot length. So actually this nested for loop works for ragged matrices. And matrix of row and column is assigned input.nextInt. So this will basically read an integer corresponding to that element, which is in row, row, and column, column. Okay. So let me actually show you this. So let me delete all of this. So instead of initializing the elements, I will actually create a scanner. So we have a scanner input, which is a new scanner for the system input. And then we ask the user, let's prompt the user, enter the number of rows. So system dot out print Ellen, enter. So here we have Let's define the matrix before the, the prompt. So I'm gonna put it here. Enter, enter M rows of M of zero length. Each. So now we have a for loop that iterates over the rows. So I need some variable that is used for the row. I will use i 
pi is less than length. And for every row, I will have another variable int j and j is less than m of i dot length. And now we initialize m of i j is input dot next int. And we have the print afterwards to see if the matrix is actually read correctly. So let's actually run this. So we are asked to enter two rows of three columns each. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the matrix that is printed back is one, two, three, four, five, six. One thing that uh, I can show you is that you can enter row by row, but you can also enter all elements in at once. So you can enter them like this and still, because it reads a row and then in, a, in an inner loop, it reads the every element in that row and then i is incremented with one. So this also works. So you can basically read the elements. It's expecting six elements. It doesn't matter if you enter them like this or you enter them all in a row or you enter them row by row. We are reading a matrix of two rows and three columns each. Any questions? So this is to initialize an array with input values. You can also initialize an array with random values. So we have the same two loops, one that iterates over the indices of the rows and one that iterates over the indices of the columns. And instead of reading with next int every matrix of row and column, we assign to it the math.random multiply with 100, cast it to an integer, because this is a matrix of integers. So this is basically self-evident that you can basically get a random matrix at any moment, just use math.random multiply with the range that you're looking for. So instead of having what we just had, instead of reading the matrix, I'm going to generate it randomly. So it's the integer part of Math dot random, and let's say that I want values between zero and a thousand. Okay, so that's basically map dot random multiply with a thousand, not including a thousand, cast it to an integer. If I wanted a thousand, then from zero to one hundred and uh, one thousand and one. So again, now if I run it, although it says enter the matrix, it directly goes and prints the matrix. So. And every time you run it, it generates other random numbers, basically, in, in that interval. OK. Yes, let's see the questions. Uh, is it representing the upper limit? So math.random gives you a value between 0 and 1 included. So basically, here you have 0 included and 1 as a double value. You multiply it with a thousand or one thousand and one, it gives you values in the interval from zero because zero multiply with one thousand and one and one thousand and one not included. Once you cast that to an integer, so that's basically a, a real number. Once you cast it to an integer, you basically get a value in the interval. Basically, this is the discrete interval, 0, 1, 2, 3, or up to 1,000. That's because basically 1,001 1, is not included. Okay. So if you want in a different interval, so let's say I don't want 0 here. I just want values between 1 and 1,000 random values then usually what you do is one plus, and then I will basically it, uh, multiply with 1000. So really what's here in this new formula is one plus zero uh, math.random from zero to one, multiply with a thousand, which is one plus, the integer part between zero and 1,000, not including 1,000, 
which is basically what you're getting is 0, 1, 2, up to 9, 999. You add one to it, and then you get from one to 1,000. Any questions? Okay. Good. Okay, so now printing. So we already wrote a method for printing. Basically, the idea is that you have an outer limit that iterates with, the in, with an index over the rows. So from row zero, as long as the row is less than the length of the matrix, and you increment the index after each iteration. Then you have an inner loop that iterates over the columns, again, from index zero, as long as the column is less than matrix of that row dot length, that's the number of elements in that row with incrementing the column after each iteration, and then an inner print statement, which prints the element at index row and column in that row, in that column, and followed by a space. So it takes row number zero, it prints all the elements in the inner loop. Then it prints a new line after each row, so it looks very nicely row one, or basically row with index zero, then it increments the index of the row with one, then it iterates again from zero to the length of row one and prints the element matrix of one and the column from zero to the length and followed by a space and followed by a new line at the end of the row. So this is basically a nested loop, a for loop for the rows, a for loop for the columns to print the elements in every uh, row. And we wrote a method for it. So we basically wrote this method, which, iter with, which basically takes a matrix of integers, doesn't return anything, returns void, has a for loop that iterates over the rows, a one that iterates over the columns, given the current row i, and then prints the elements at index i, j for uh, every row i and column j. At the end of each, col uh, each row, it prints a new line. And then I had a new line after the entire matrix is printed. The method doesn't return anything. It's just basically containing uh, those two nested for loops that we had in printing two dimensional arrays. Now, one thing that I told you about arrays is that you can use what is called a for each loop. So remember that, and then I will show you how that works for multidimensional arrays. So let's say that we have an integer array A, and this was some array, one, two, three, four. And you have two ways to print it. You can use an index, integer i starting from zero, as long as i is less than a dot length. And i is incremented with one after each iteration. And then you had system dot out print a of i followed by a space. So that was one way to print it. Another way to print it, I told you that you can use a for each loop. For every, this is an array of integers. So for every integer element in A, you can directly write system.out.print E for the element followed by a space. So this is a special type of loop, which basically, instead of writing the indices, iterate from i equals zero to the length and then print a of i, you actually bind the new variable e to every element in a with what is called a for each loop. And then you use that variable inside to basically print the, the elements of uh, that array. So that can be extended to matrices. Remember the fact that a matrix is just an array of arrays, okay? So I can actually, instead of writing that loop for every integer i from zero, i is less than, in this case, m dot length i plus plus, and then an inner for loop for indices for every integer j starting from zero 
j is less than m of i dot length j plus plus and then system dot out dot print a m of i j concatenated with a space and then a new line for after each row I can write this with a for each loop. Now, at the first dimension, actually the, the type of elements are arrays of integers. So when I write the first loop, I write for every integer array, let's call it row in the matrix M. Then row is an array of integers. So I can use the same idea that we've wrote for, for each loops in a, a simple arrays. So for every integer E in a row, I can now basically print E followed by a space and a new line after each row. And we finish the block because we need two statements. So you see, this is much shorter. Basically, instead of writing for every index and then using the indices for the row and the column to access the elements, I can iterate over the matrix, which is in, in fact an array of uh, rows of integers, uh, uh, integer arrays. So basically, iterating with uh, for each loop over a matrix gives you every row separately as an integer array or as an array. And then, because that's an array of integers, we can use the same system that we wrote for, for each loops for arrays. So for every va value E in that row, I can basically bind E to every element one by one. So you see that is a much simplified way to actually write the same thing, but instead of using indices, I use directly for each loops. So let me actually show you that this works exactly as expected. So instead of writing this whole big code that I have here, let's comment it out. I'm gonna comment out this entire code. I'm going to use a for each loop for every row in my matrix, which is A named here. And for every element in the row, I print the elements of a row and then I print the new line after each row. So let's run this one. And you see that it actually prints the same, prints the matrix. So the same printing, but it's much simpler. Instead of using indices, it uses for each loops. Okay. So that's basically for each loops. So you can print. 2D arrays, 3D arrays, we'll see multidimensional arrays with for each loops because basically the matrix is an array of arrays. So every element of the matrix is actually an array of the elements in that uh, row. So for every row, and you can give any name that you want. I use a row because it's basically easier to understand. The matrix contains rows. Each row contains an integer uh, arrays. So basically, for every integer element in the row, I print the element. And then after I print every row, I print a new line. Any questions? So you can basically write this kind of uh, loops for summing all the elements in the matrix, uh, computing average of all the elements and so on. So let's see some examples. So let's say that I want to sum all the elements in a matrix. So I define a variable total, an integer variable total equal with zero, because this is an integer matrix. If I would have used a, a, a double matrix, this would have been a double. And then an outer for loop that iterates over the indices from zero to the length of the matrix, the number of rows, and an inner for loop that iterates over the columns in the current row from zero to the uh, index, which is the length of the row. Basically, the maximum is how long is that row. And the total is incremented with matrix of row and column. If you want to write exactly the same, but using for each loop, this simplifies much more. So we define the variable total equal with 0. 
And for every row, which is an integer array in the matrix, and for every element, which is an integer in the row, the total is incremented with that element. And this is basically how you write uh, summing all the elements with the for each loop. Any questions before we continue? Okay. Now, let's say that we want to compute the sum of every column. So instead of iterating over the rows, we iterate over the columns. So like, let's say, let's see this example here. So we generate a random matrix. I want actually for every column, the sum of the elements in that column. So I want, for instance, 455 plus 211 to be 662. The sum of the first column is 662, then the sum of the second column, then the sum of the third column. So this is what I want. I want to iterate not over the rows and for every row compute the sum of elements in that row, but iterate over all the columns. So in this case, I actually need indices. So I iterate with an index between zero to the length of the, the first row, matrix of zero dot length. This assumes that the matrix is rectangular because only then you can iterate over the first row, the columns and have exactly the same number of elements in every other row. So I iterate with an index column from zero to as long as is less than the matrix of zero dot length. I define a variable total equal with zero for every column. I iterate over the rows with an index from row equal zero to matrix dot length, the number of rows in my matrix. And I increment and the total is incremented with matrix of row and column. After I finish the inner loop, I basically have the total for the elements in the column, in the given column. So really, I iterate with an outer loop over the columns with an inner loop over the rows. So after one iteration, I can print out that the sum for that given column is the total that was computing, computed for that column. Okay. So let me show you this code for our example. So we basically had a random matrix. And after I print the matrix, I basically want the sum of every column. I only change the variable M to matrix to M. So here you have, you have first the matrix itself and then the sum for column zero, which is 783 plus three, uh, 349 is 1,132. And the sum for the second column or the column with index one, is 706 and for the third column is 931. So basically the column with index two, the sum is that value. So this is basically how you could do this task of computing the sum for every column. You can do all kinds of operations. You can actually look on the major diagonal where the indices of the row and the column are the same. You can row, look at the secondary diagonal where basically the absolute value of the index of the row plus the index of the column is equal with uh, the number of rows and columns. This is only for a rectangular, uh, for a square matrix and other things like for instance, in your lab today and tomorrow, basically, or tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, the today and yesterday actually. So basically you can check all of these different diagonals and rows and columns. I can basically, if we have time, we can actually do that. Any questions? Okay, good. Now, another task. Given a matrix, I want a random permutation of the matrix. So what I can do is to iterate from zero to the length of the matrix, which is basically the number of rows in the matrix. And from zero to the length of the current row matrix of I, 
that's the elements in the every single row. And for every element, for every index i and j, row number i and uh, column number j, I define two new variables. i1 is math.random multiplied with the matrix length. That will give you, after you cast to an integer, a random row i1, basically from zero to the length of the matrix, which is a random row index in the matrix. And j1 is math.random multiplied with matrix of i1 dot length. This basically says that given that row, give me one random index, one random column in that row. So basically what I get here, and this works for uh, ranked matrices, because basically given a row index, it gives you exactly an index in that row, not in a different row. And then you swap the elements, matrix of i and j, the original element, with matrix of i1 and j1, a random other element in the matrix. So a temporary variable is defined and assigned matrix of ij. Now, because I have the value of matrix of ij saved, I can use matrix of ij to assign a value in into it of matrix of i1 and j1, and matrix of i1 and j1 is assigned temp. So basically, we swap the two values by putting matrix of ij in a temporary variable, copying matrix of i1, j1 into matrix of ij, and assigning to matrix of i1, j1 the temporary value. So this does a random shuffling of my matrix. No matter what was mat matrix was, it randomly for every element in every row, in every column, it finds a randomly another element and swaps it with the current element. So this really creates a permutation. Every time you run the program, we'll get a different mixing of the elements in the matrix. Now, you can extend this idea of two-dimensional matrices to three-dimensional matrices, four-dimensional matrices. You can think that basically the additional dimension is like in a cube. You have now sectionals through the matrix. So really, basically, if you want, let's say I'm teaching multiple classes, I'm teaching three, five courses, 30 students in each course, and in each course there are 25 labs. So I can basically use uh, a three-dimensional matrix, a matrix that has, uh, in this case, let's change a little bit the order. So I'm teaching, let's say, five courses of 30 students each uh, of uh, uh, 25 labs in each course, okay? So in that case, I basically have, the first dimension is the courses, the second dimension are the students in each course, and the third dimension are the labs in each for, each, for every student. So for instance, if I want to assign that a student participated in lab uh, one in my first course, I can use scores of zero, my first course, the first student in that course, the first lab in that course is basically uh, the, the student got the uh, course, uh, got the lab. Okay. Any questions? So these are multidimensional matrices, multidimensional multi arrays. Uh, Instead of going to the objects and classes, let me help you with uh, maybe the lab for multidimensional matrices. So one problem, the first problem is to implement a tic-tac-toe. A tic-tac-toe, I assume that all of you played, is a three by three matrix where one player puts a, 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 a zero or an X and the other player puts the opposite zero or, or an X and it's turn by turn. So basically every player put in one of the locations a zero and an X and the game ends the moment that a player either has a diagonal, a major diagonal, minor diagonal or row or column with uh, uh, all the values set, okay? 
So basically, we'll, we, we want to implement a game of tic-tac-toe. So basically, let's create a new file. Any questions about matrices up to now? I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Okay, so let's start a game of tic-tac-toe. So first of all, we need the matrix. So let's call it M and is a new integer matrix of three columns and three elements each. Now we have two players. So will basically be a turn. So we need some integer, let's call it turn, which in is, is initialized to zero at the beginning. Basically zero or one being the first player or the second player. In fact, let me use one and two. And then we have a counter. Basically this basically says uh, how many turns have, have there been. So the counter is initialized to let's say zero and we can actually write now the main loop of the game. So while the counter is still less than nine, uh, we basically have a turn. So we can basically, actually I don't need a variable turn because I can already see that even numbers or odd numbers. So we can ask the user, System dot out print. player and here we can actually give the number of the player so if the number let's use the conditional expression if the counter modulo two is equal with zero then it's player one otherwise it's player two uh, let's say player two or player one move and they will have to enter there is a question in the chat. Would n dimensional array require n loops? Yes, exactly. You got it. You need basically one uh, nested loop for every dimension. For the first dimension, then the second dimension, the third dimension, and so on. Yeah. Okay. So now we are expecting the user to enter row and column and let's say that the user doesn't is not a programmer so doesn't enter zero and ones so when we read it we basically need to uh, print the location so we will we'll use indices minus one we need the method for uh, uh, for printing the matrix so let's write it again Void print matrix and it takes in our case again and um, do we need an yeah an integer would be good but yeah let's use an integer actually why don't we use a character r matrix r matrix so this is a car matrix Let's call it again, maybe C, maybe not C, M. And now we have a for loop that iterates over the rows. And then we have a for loop that iterates over the characters in every row, V for value. And we print the value concatenated with the space and a new line for every row and maybe a new line after each matrix. So actually maybe not, we'll leave it like that. So before every move, we are going to print the matrix.
Okay. Now, the user enters a location. So let's define a scanner. The system input. And we are going to use it to read the location. So integer i is, and we are assuming that the user enters uh, from one to three, both of them. So input dot next line dot, uh, not go, okay, dot character at index zero for the actually I'm reading a, a location. So next integer, sorry about that. And the same, I basically need the location J and each of them because the user enters from zero to, from one to three and columns one to three, I need to subtract one. So now, depending on the user, so m of i j is assigned. So now again, depending on if it's the odd user or the even user, the first user has the character x and the second user has the character o. Okay, good. Now, so let's actually see if this works. So up to here, basically, uh, initially I have all the characters empty. Let me actually also print something for empty. So we should initialize this matrix actually to a matrix of characters three by three. So I'm going to actually use, let's say, E for empty. And I need three by three. So this is second and third. So good. So basically everything is empty. Player one will enter uh, X and Y. So let's say that the player one enters at one and one. So now there is an X allocation one. And now player two should be the one so why do I get player one again? Because I didn't increment a counter. And actually, why don't I just increment it here with a post increment? So let's run it again. Let's kill it. So actually, we will have here conditions to if somebody wins, check. Or win, and but we need in case that nobody actually won a print at the end saying that it's a draw. So let's run it again. So I have a ma empty matrix, and now I enter one, one, and I have an O. So why is that? Ah, uh, the counter ah. Uh, because here the counter is actually for the second player. So not plus plus here, but plus plus here. In fact, why don't I just do the plus plus at the end? Because I will also need to do other checks. So let's play it again. So now the matrix is empty. I enter one, one, that's an X. And then let's say the player two enters two, two. And that's an O. And then the player three, a uh, player one again enters uh, one, two, and that's an X. And then player two enters, let's say, uh, two, three, and that's an O. So you can basically see that it, it starts to form the X and O. Okay, there was a question in the chat. 
Hi, Professor. How different would it be if you change the code for an n by n array, not three by three? Uh, basically, instead of initializing it in line, as I did here, I would have to write two for loops to initialize every element. So no, not, a dif not much different. Would it be ineffective to use spaces for the empty elements? Uh, if you do, then you don't actually see the matrix. So that's why I put something in it. Basically, I wanted to see something like E or, or something. So that's my reason to use E, but I don't see a problem if you use spaces. Is it better to use characters uh, or I assume empty characters? It's the same. Would how to make sure that there is no space reused? Ah, easy. So here, instead of directly assigning, I can actually check. So if m of i j is already equal with x or m of i j is already equal with O, then basically I need, I don't increment, I basically just uh, inform the user system dot out dot print that space is already used. That that location is already used. And maybe a break. Break. So I don't ac actually execute anything afterwards. So only if it was not X or zero, then I initialize it. I assign to you to it X or zero. That responds basically to that. Okay. So now let's check for win. Okay. So now we need to check if uh, one user didn't already win. So in that case, actually, instead of break, I need continue now. So let's check the rows. So for every uh, row, integer, I need a character for whose turn is currently. So I need a character for that. R C is equal with that. Okay, so for every row, integer i from zero, i is less than m dot length, i plus plus. And for every column, I basically will check if it's true that every column is actually equal with uh, with that character. So I start with row number zero i, and then I have a Boolean win is equal with true. And here I have for every column, from zero, as long as J is less than M of zero, M of I dot length. And if uh, M of I J is equal with the character, is different than the character, then win is equal with false. But if after I execute this loop, I found out that if win, then system dot out print uh, C1. So whoever was playing that character won. I can actually also identify the player. So I could get player one or player two, one. Let me do that. 
So that player won. And then actually I can do it right here. System.exit. It's uh, just uh, basically it's done. So I don't need to verify again the win outside. So now we checked. I don't, I can't use I and J now. I just realized because those are the variables that I used before. So let's write I2, 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 J2, 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 J2. It's not very efficient because I'm checking all the rows instead of just checking the row that was just modified by that user. So maybe I should have done that, but it's okay. I mean, this, this works as well. So I just checked all the rows. There was a question in the chat. Does this account for diagonals? No, no, this is just a uh, checks for the win that one of the rows is uh, good. So now let's do the columns. So I will do it similarly. So for every, instead of I, I'm gonna use J. As long as J is less than the, let's say the columns in a row J. And now I use I for the row number. And here I can use just M. And if I2 of J2 is different than the character and is false, if it's win, then also the player won. So this checks for the columns. Now there are only two diagonals, the major diagonal and the minor diagonal. I can basically just use an if statement for each one of them. So if M of zero, zero is equal with the character C and M of one, one and two, two is equal with the character C. So all of them are equal with the character C. Then again, the player one by the first diagonal. Other uh, and break, actually, let me do the same thing as before or exit. Okay. Or if Again, the and now it's up zero, two, one, one, and two, zero is that character, then the same player one. I think I'm done. So let's try it. So run it. So initially everything is empty. Let's say that the first player puts at one, one, the second player puts maybe at uh, two one, then the first player puts at one, two, then the second player puts at two, two, then the first player puts at one, three, and player one, one, because he basically got uh, the first row completed. Yes, of course, I'm gonna post it on Piazza. So this is tic-tac-toe, a sample of tic-tac-toe is not very efficient, but is but is uh, working quite well. Can I, yeah, good, make it, send it down. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, Sorry for going over time with about five minutes. Uh, see you next class. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day. You too.